I'm going to be going over five things that you might expect that you might be doing as a structural engineer and compare that versus the reality as you're actually doing it, as you're actually working in the industry. Hi, I'm Matt and I'm a structural engineer in the Southern California area. Let's get started with today's content. Expectation number one, you got your bachelor's, you even got your master's in structural engineering. You are so ready for the structural engineering industry. The reality, you don't know shit. Sure, you know how to do your fancy analysis and your Hardy Cross method and your direct design method, which is good, but a lot of those things that they teach you in school are, are pretty much outdated. They teach you nothing about how to actually design efficiently and effectively in the real world. You don't know anything about how a structural engineering business runs. What are the important things? You'll find out that, hey, calcs sometimes aren't the most important thing. You're not taught how things are constructed out in the field, how to make them practical and buildable. And you'll have to learn about detailing, which they teach you pretty much very little about in school. And that's one of the things that I like about the structural engineering industry. There is a lot to learn, but for me, that's I'm always in the learning mindset. So I'm glad that there's always something to learn. There's always something that I don't know. And as a new structural engineer for you, make sure to ask questions because your superiors know that you don't know a lot about structural engineering and how the business works, or at least they should. So they should be expecting you to ask them questions. Expectation number two. I've never done this type of design before. They'll teach me or, or at least they'll check my work, right? The reality is not all the time. If you end up in a good structural engineering design firm, they should be checking your work some way, somehow. They just might do some spot checks or doing the right sizes. But even then, whoever's checking your work, don't expect them to check all of your hand calculations that you're using the variables right or you're using the correct method. What they're mostly gonna be doing is seeing if your design looks correct, if it's sized to a decent, uh, to a decent size number that they're used to seeing. So it is up to you to double check your work and make sure that all of your calculations are adding up. So my advice is that you just have to be resourceful. If you're learning a new subject or if you haven't designed, let's say, some a steel beam before, you have to get the books, you have to do the research, you have to learn on your own time to make sure that you're doing the calculations correctly. Be resourceful, check your own work, make sure to do your own back checks on yourself instead of relying on others. They will check your work, but only you're the you're the one that knows the most about whatever analysis method, analysis design that you're doing. So make sure you know how to double check your own work. Expectation number three, you're gonna be doing a lot of calculations and software and analysis all day. Reality, you'll be doing a lot of calculations, but that's not all you're gonna be doing. As you're starting off as a younger engineer, you're probably gonna spend half your time on, uh, yes, actually doing calculations and, and software programs but you'll also be doing a lot of things that aren't calculations and analysis. Your main weakness jumping from uh, a student to a working professional is that you don't know any of the business of a structural engineering firm, how they get their clients, how they make their money, how their firm operates, and the different phases of design and construction. So depending on what phase you're in, you're you're gonna be putting different priorities on different tasks. For example, if you're in the schematic or design development phase, you won't be doing a lot of calculations. You may just be doing a simple hand calc to calculate some preliminary member sizes, but you're not gonna be going in depth during that phase. So there's gonna be a lot of coordination. There's gonna be a lot of coordination with the architects, uh, maybe the owner, the mechanical, electrical, and the plumbing engineers you guys will be going back and forth and there's probably not a lot of calculations that you have to do, but you will be doing a lot of the drawings because a lot of you guys don't know, our product is not the calculations for the most part. It's the drawings. For, the, for most firms, that's what the end product is. The contractors need our drawings, the blueprints, in order to build the actual structure. Calcs are important, but they're not as important to the owner, to the contractor, to the architect as our drawings, because that's how we communicate with the entire team. The whole building design process, they need our blueprints. And that's what we spend a lot of the time doing too, making sure our drawings look correct, making sure they're shown correctly on the plan. So you'll be doing a lot of back checking and marking up of the drawings, along with doing calculations also. And like I'm alluding here, your technical skills aren't um, optional. 
they're a requirement, they're a prerequisite before you even get into your first structural engineering job. And in order to advance your structural engineering career, yes, you still need technical, but everyone knows that you're already technical, you're already smart, the clients and the owners already know that. But the, I think the missing link is the communication skills, all the business skills, all the soft skills that you're not too aware of that will actually make you a lot more valuable, a lot more complete structural engineer. One of the most valuable things that you can do as a young structural engineer for your firm is to actually keep the clients happy. Make them a repeat client because if you can make them a repeat, repeat client, that's bringing in money for your firm. If you can be a good communicator to your client, let's say it's the architect, if you can be responsive, if you can coordinate with them and compromise on the things and bring up things that add value to your client, that's something that not every structural engineer can do. They, every structural engineer can do calculations, but not every structural engineer can bring a firm business, can bring repeat clients back, can bring clients in. And like I just said, your firm can just hire another structural engineer that can do calculations. It makes you more replaceable. But if you can develop these skills, you can, you can be a reliable person to work with and you're a great commuter via email, via drawings, via in-person, via in-phone, that's something that not every structural engineer has and it's one of the most important things for a firm. Th those are the ones that are a lot more irreplaceable. So if you want to get ahead in your career, start being aware of those skills. One thing that helped me out before I got my first structural engineering position was learning about the building process and how the contractors, architects, and owners, how they all work together to build a building. Because knowing what everyone is trying to do in the project definitely helps uh, you find your where you fit into the picture. One of the ways that I did that was reading a book called Skyscraper, The Making of a Building. I recommend that book because when I went to, into the industry, I wasn't like a deer in the headlights. I still was, but it wasn't as bad if I didn't read that book. So I'll put that book in the comments below and I'll link it. Expectation number four. You got a design project in school and you did great on it, so you can design a building, right? Reality, no. I know you probably had a building design uh, project in school, but it's probably not as detailed as you would expect that all the stuff that needs to go into actually uh, designing a complete building and all the coordination that goes into it. So for example, if your project in school, they gave you a floor layout and hey, design the shear walls and the gravity framing, you probably only sized, uh, let's say the size of the members and maybe you put the reinforcement in there and the building didn't change. In the real world, the architect is going to constantly change the designs for the most part, along with mechanical, electrical, plumbing, you're gonna have to coordinate all those things so plumbing doesn't go through your beams, uh, electrical doesn't go through your walls. One of the main differences of the projects that you designed in school versus actual real world projects are, I think the main things are the design drawings and the amount of the details that go into it and the coordination between the architect and MEP. But in actual construction drawing sets, the details are the things that are one of the most important because they need those details to construct. And those are the most important because like I said before, I think your building is going to fail. If it's going to fail, it's gonna fail because your details weren't correct. It's rare that a member is undersized. And even when your analysis is complete, your construction documents, your, your blueprints are done and complete and they're out to the field, you're not done yet. You still have the construction support uh, services phase, basically the contractor is going to run into some problems and they're going to have questions about their drawings when you're when they're constructing it. So the structural engineer, you, will most likely have to go there and support them. You'll be doing structural observations, making sure they're they're doing things correctly, they're interpreting the drawings correctly. And if they mess anything up in the field, you're there to provide a solution for, for those. Expectation number five. You're only gonna work 40 hours, right? The reality is most likely not. Look, it's a deadline-based industry, so kind of like in school, if you have an exam, you're most likely gonna be putting in more hours the closer to the exam deadline. Same thing in the structural engineering industry. When we have deadlines, we'll tend to put in more work and to basically get those deadlines done. So you may be working 
uh, 50 hour weeks, 60 hour weeks. Hopefully you're not working 80 hour weeks, but um, it does happen on some firms. And with that, again, not all firms are the same. Some firms, yes, they may make you work uh, 60, 70, 80 hours on a consistent weekly basis. And that's more of how the company culture is for that firm and how they run their business. And there are other firms that may make you work only 40 hours a week because if you work more, they're gonna charge, they're gonna have to pay you overtime and they don't wanna do that. So those firms do exist. For me personally, I tend to work uh, 50 hour weeks on average and when it comes uh, closer to the deadlines, then that's when I'll maybe put in 60 hours, but it's rare that I've ever done um, an 80 hour week. So it definitely depends on your firm. Just because you hear someone saying that they work 80 hours doesn't mean that the whole industry and every firm operates the same way. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So make sure to like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.